Good afternoon, everybody. We're bringing you, I guess, good evening now, actually. But we're bringing you the final volume of Rebecca Crumb. And it's not, not long. It's only like nine minutes or ten minutes, something like that. But that does wrap it up for the person most knowledgeable deposition for Rebecca Crumb. James will be posting the consolidated volume three. There's one big video tomorrow. So if you want to catch up and see the whole thing as opposed to bits and pieces, then that will be available tomorrow under the Pellerin, um, was it Pellerin versus Arizona mm -hmm. file tab in YouTube? And yeah, I'll, I'll put a link on it. Okay, he'll put a link on it so you can get to it. Um, remember, like, share, subscribe, comments are open so you guys can get on there and chat amongst yourselves, develop some relationships. I think that's really cool. And we'll have a special treat for you. Afterwards, Darian and I took a road trip on Monday night. For those of you who don't know, Darian's my daughter. Uh, we took a road trip on Monday out to the desert, Palm Springs, to do a deposition. And she took some short clips, you know, like behind the scenes type stuff as we were going along. On some of it I knew she was recording, on some of it I didn't really know, but I figured out. So anyway, it's like some candid stuff. Should be pretty fun. Anyway, again, like, share, subscribe, and any questions. We would like questions from you for the podcast on Sunday. Send them to Caps and Stems at Caps and Stems Law. Caps and Stems Law at gmail.com. Again, that's caps and stems law at gmail.com. Anything else? All right, that's it. Enjoy the show, and we'll talk to you a little bit later. Thanks. Be funding. First, the child must be removed from the home. And then, second, the court must make that order that continuation in the home is contrary to the child's best interest. That's correct so far, correct? Yes. And if those two factors are not satisfied, that is they're not met, the child's not removed from the home or the court does not make those specific findings, then the state could lose hundreds or millions of dollars. Correct. So it, it is very important, number one, that the child be removed, and number two, that the court make specific findings that continuation in the home would be detrimental to the child, otherwise the state loses millions of dollars. To receive that funding, yes. Yeah, and that could be millions of dollars. It could be. Yeah. And the state would lose it if those two specific criteria are not met. Well, not that we would lose it, but we wouldn't then be reimbursed or get that money. What's the difference? If you don't get the money, you lost the money. Well, if the kid's never out of care, then we wouldn't need the money to spend on them anyway to sustain them right. out of care. Right. We're talking about just the situation under which your state would get money, right? Right. If you don't seize a child from the home, you don't get money, right? Right. Because the child's not in care, we don't have to provide services, we don't have anything to pay for, right? Right. So the only way that the state, your agency, gets money from the federal government is if it removes that child from the home, correct? I don't know if that's the only way, but I know that's one way. Under Title IV-E, what do you train your workers about how the state gets its money in relation to the work they do for your agency? What do you teach them? Under, for, for the Title IV e-funding, that's yes. correct, but I don't know about the other grants and all of that stuff. Okay. The only possible. thing we're talking about right now okay. is the exhibit that's in front of you, Title right. IV e-funding. In order to qualify for Title IV e-funding, you train your workers that they must remove that child from the home. That's the first step, right? Yes. Then the second step you train your workers is that they must obtain from the court an order that says continuation in the home is contrary to the best interest of the child, correct? Correct. And, if, and you teach them this. If they don't follow those two steps, your agency does not get the money under Title IV-E, correct? Correct. And that the failure to follow those two steps could cost the state millions of dollars, correct? Yes. Okay. Ma'am, one thing that... Uh, I didn't cover with you yet, and that was the seizure of children from school. What do you train your workers, particularly investigations workers, with respect to their power to seize children from the custody of their parents while the child is at school? Um, that, in addition to the temporary custody notice, they would also need to serve the school with a notice of removal. Okay, so so with respect, I want to focus for a minute just on what you teach them their their power is. Do you train them that they have the power to seize a child from the custody of its parents while the child is at school? Yes. Do they need to get a court order according to your training? Do they need to get a court order permitting them to do that? No. Is there any set of circumstances ever under which 
or do you train your social worker, do you train your workers, whether it's investigative workers or somebody else, that there is any set of circumstances or some set of circumstances under which they must get a prior court order before detaining a child from the custody of its parents while the child is at school? No. Okay. And it's your view as the agency that, in fact, there is no such requirement. That is the requirement that a court order be obtained before seizing the child from the custody of its parents at school. Correct. Do you know why that is? No. Because when a child's at school, let's say it's, I don't know, 10 a.m., and uh, the child's in class with teachers, students, things like that, the child's not in immediate danger of any kind, right? Not necessarily, no. And even if there were some impending danger, that danger wouldn't occur until the child left school and went home, right? Or and back to the environment wherever this supposed danger exists. Unless the parent picked them up from school. Okay. So if the parent doesn't pick them up for school and the school day doesn't end until, say, 2.30 or so, that would give you between 10 and 2, roughly four and a half hours to go get a court order, for example, if you thought you might need to do that, right? Well, it would, de it would depend on what was going on. I mean, I'm gonna potentially no, because they might, the parent might come pick them up. Okay. I'm gonna ask you to assume that the parent is not going to pick the child up from school until the child gets out of school as in the regular course, okay? Okay. And that you discover that there may be some issue with the child, you go out and interview the child about 10 a.m. in the morning and, and the child says, oh yeah, there's a problem, okay? So there is a problem, there is a danger, but the parent's not going to pick up the child until four or five hours later. Are you with me? Okay. Is there any requirement, according to your agency, that the worker get a court order before removing that child under no. that circumstance? No. They can just do it? Correct. When an investigator is out investigating allegations that come in from the hotline, is that investigator actually required to interview the particular witnesses? Witnesses meaning? Well, let's start with the person who made the report. The source, if we have an identified source, yes. Okay, they're required to interview them, correct? They need to contact the source if we have that information, yes. What does that mean, contact? Do they just call them up and say hi, or do they actually talk to them and interview them? Yes, they, they call them and, and talk to them. Well, for us, interview means a, a global assessment, so I suppose you're meaning interview in more the general sense, but yes, they would call them up and ask them if they had anything additional to add to their report, if there was any other concerns that they had. Well, one of the reasons, and correct me if I'm wrong, one of the reasons that the worker is required to make contact with the reporting party is to verify that what is stated in the referral is, a, is actually what the reporting party has reported and said. Correct. Okay, and then secondarily, you want to make sure that there's not more to it than what's in the referral, right? Correct. So you, in a sense, are doing two things there. You're, you're ensuring that what's reported in the referral is true and correct, right? Yes. And then also making sure that there's not some additional information that would either exacerbate or ameliorate the situation, correct? Correct. Okay, and that's another one of those safeguards, isn't it, that we put in place to ensure a fair, consistent, and just process, right? Yes. Is we have somebody verifying the accuracy and validity of what's reported in the hotline referral. Yes. And you teach your workers that that's a critical step in the process, correct? If they're able to, yes. Okay. What about uh, speaking with the, if there's witnesses that are known, the existence of witnesses are known to the investigator, do they have an obligation to speak with those witnesses, actually interview those witnesses? So you mean like a collateral contact, somebody who else who might have reasonable information? Sure. Yes. Okay. And again, that necessity that they speak with the collateral contact to obtain their information, that's another one of those safeguards that we have in place to ensure a fair, consistent, and just process, right? Correct. And you train your, so your workers that? Yes. Okay. And that that's a critical step in the process as well? Yes. Okay. And that they are not to be jumping in and seizing children without some evidence to show that the child actually is in danger of suffering and the injury, right? In injury broader term, yes. Okay. And they're not to speculate 
about injuries, they need to have evidence showing that, yeah, some injury is going to happen, right? Well, physical, sexual, emotional, yes. Right, some physical, sexual, emotional injury is, is likely to happen. They've got to have solid evidence for that, right? Correct. Okay. They can't just have concerns, right? Correct. Correct. The concerns standing alone are insufficient basis to seize a child from the custody of its parents, correct? Correct. And you teach your workers that? Yes. So in 2013, if a worker, one of the workers, sees children from the custody of is their parents based on concerns, that would have been in violation of their training? Yes. Okay. Okay, I believe, at least as to the issues that she has said she is designated and qualified to speak to as the person most knowledgeable, that I am done all right i hope you guys enjoyed that i know it was short keep it short and sweet right but uh that's the end of it for <laughs> you heard that <laughs> that's the end of it for um shit i lost my train of thought that's the end of it for crumb crumb that's the end of it for crumb she's done uh like i said james will be posting complete um volume three tomorrow in the meantime we're going to be rolling into deborah harper and she was one of the directors of the agency not director but like a program manager at the agency higher up in the you know food chain as far as the chain of command goes um she gave a really interesting deposition i think you're gonna enjoy her also same case peller and v wagner and uh james will start cutting that up and getting that up next i don't know what the eta on thursday. publication is he's saying thursday you should see that so in the meantime, enjoy what we have up there so far. Remember, email your questions to capsandstemslaw at gmail.com. Again, that's capsandstemslaw at gmail.com. And we'll try to address them at the podcast on Sunday. In the meantime, you have a wonderful evening, and we'll look forward to your questions. Have a good night. <laughs>